Hey son, what are you doing? Put your hands on the fan. And what's this? It's crystal, isn't it? Crystal, a synthetic drug. One of the cheapest, one of the strongest. Come on, buddy, lay off the drugs. They're no good for you, they'll only get you into trouble, and it's obvious you haven't been taking them for long. Those who have been taking drugs for a long time are thin. Ah, and now you're showing your ass. I just landed in Mexico, 12 hours of flight and 20 degrees outside. There's no winter here, it's Mexican California. At the end of the highway, Tijuana. At the end of Tijuana, the Pacific. If there were tourists, they'd take pictures of the mariachis. Wrestlers. Or street food vendors. But there are no tourists in Tijuana. Only concrete, cars and extra-large shopping malls. And then everywhere, dollar signs. This is the last stop before the United States. On the other side, the other California, American and full of dreams. San Diego's skyscrapers, they're visible to the naked eye from Tijuana Beach. But between the two Californias, there's a border, to the south, Mexico, and to the north, the richest country in the world. On the edge of El Dorado, Tijuana. In Tijuana, the border makes people live. And makes them die. Those who want to cross to the north and those who traffic with the north. Immigration and drugs, the city's two businesses. Tourism will have to wait. In Tijuana, I'll follow crime reporters, tuned into police frequencies. I'll visit crime scenes of everyday ultraviolence. And I'll join night patrols, with car chases and sudden arrests. I'll go to maximum security prison, meant to break the gangs. I'll visit giant brothels, run with an iron fist. And then I'll see the American dreams flip side in the faces of these ghosts. Homeless, drug addicts, they've stayed on the wrong side of the border. Tijuana, their last stop. Welcome to Tijuana, the last town in the Wild West, with, in your pocket, a passport to crime. To get to know a country, you have to taste its cuisine. That's how I like to travel. I've been a chef for 20 years. I have two Michelin stars in Paris. But abroad, what I prefer is street food. In Mexico, tacos are king, they're served all kinds of ways. It's a real interplay of textures, because you've got the crispness of the taco, and at the same time, you've got the juiciness of the meat there, and the spicy sauce, which tingles, adds relief, and to sweeten things up, fresh guacamole. It's perfect, it's just not very easy to eat. You get your fingers a little dirty, but it's just delicious. Good and popular, it speaks to me. Today, I work in a palace, but I grew up in the projects, I've seen a lot. I was in the army in another life, I served in Lebanon, not a spring chicken as they say. 
This is Tijuana, after all, so even to earn a few pesos on the street, you have to pay for a piece of sidewalk. Depending on the neighborhood, not necessarily in a very legal way. They're not paying Mr. Mayor. They're not paying the mayor. This isn't the 20th arrondissement. Tonight, things get serious. I'm with the Homicide Division. He's the boss, Commissioner Jimenez. A man has just been reported dead in a hotel room. This is the place. Hotel Paradise. The misnomer. Here, the victim went through hell. All right, let's go. Special authorization, we'll be able to film the crime scene. For the moment, no one goes in, we must let the forensic team do their work. We're going to work here for a while with the experts to try to determine the motive for the crime and find out what caused the victim's death and also establish the time of death. The mattress is not in its place, was there a confrontation? In any case, the outline of the scenario is unfortunately very clear. Look at the victim. His hands are bound with tape. This is an assassination. The scientific team makes its report. I'll give you all the indications north to east. But there's a stain there. This plainclothes inspector has a good eye. The scientists had just missed a clue. Can you analyze the stain to see if it's blood or not? Immediate reagent analysis. If it's blood, the color will change. It's positive. Now we've got a ninth clue, a blood stain. By the entrance, the hotel receptionist answers the police's first questions, then ours. I came to check on his room to see if we could clean it. I knocked on the door, opened it, and discovered the body in the bathroom. Do you know him? No. I knew him as Roberto, but nothing more. I didn't know the person. How long ago did he arrive? A week? Yeah, five days, about five. There's a lot going on here. This is the border. See what I mean? In the room, the experts let the investigators in. Two meters, 20. Do you mind if we take a look at the clues in this area first, and then proceed through here? Shall we? The clues are now being catalogued and sealed. There's an ashtray with two cigarette butts. Who smoked the cigarette butts, the victim or the murderer? Okay, let's see it. Then there's a one liter bottle of seal brand mineral water, and this one is 50 centiliters. A sandal, a bottle, a straw, the lab may find fingerprints or traces of DNA. But in a hotel room, guests and DNA come and go. Is that hair there? Say, there are lots. There's at least 50,000. Well, with that, we're going to find some that belong to people we know. Even to the chicken we killed on the beach, this dive is definitely a place for chickens. 
Black humor from the commissioner as he opens the victim's suitcase. At the bottom, an envelope. A simple family photo. The victim, probably with his children. It would take more than that to move the commissioner. He looks like a cowboy, with his fucking boots. And kind of tight in his pants, with his gold belt. He's got to be mustachioed, you know, a real frontiersman from the canyon's far end. See, some man. The commissioner is only half joking. The belt gives a clue. The buckle is typical of the region of Sinaloa, famous for its bloodthirsty cartel. The murder smells of retaliation between drug traffickers. With drugs, it starts with shit and ends in shit. What's terrible is that there's such a level of violence here that I have the impression that everyone has got used to it, even though it's unbearable. Also, all the codes linked to executions, they're bound to be messages. Who's got the fingernails to rip off the plaster? No, I don't. What do you want? There are scissors here. He's got a knife. The commissioner asks us to stop filming. The mortician takes the body for autopsy. The police seal off the room. Bad publicity for Hotel Paradise. What's the cause of death tonight? Sounds like quite a violent situation. This was an execution. His hands and feet were tied, and he was gagged with a blue adhesive strip. And he choked to death. Was the man tortured? Did they try to make him talk? Did he know the murderers? Not sure the case will ever be solved. In Tijuana, there are more questions than answers. Drugs and Immigration, Tijuana's Two Businesses. Last night, I was in the world of drugs, this morning, I'll get a look at the world of migrants. Half the city is without electricity. A huge transformer was cut. Because of this man who climbed the installations. The fire department is there, along with the police and even the army. Journalists come running. A man, an emigrant, is threatening to commit suicide. This is Luis Andrade, journalist for the weekly newspaper La Frontera. I'm making a video of everything. To show all of it. The man can jump at any moment. It makes my hair stand on end. It looks like he's holding on to that bar there. But it looks super thin. He's gonna tire. Does he really kill himself if he falls? I hope he comes down in one piece. His name is Ian Carlos. He is 29 and from Michoacan. He apparently was deported by the United States and is saying that his life is worthless. Some police officers here have told me that they have asked the army and federal police for assistance. They did indeed come as reinforcements. Okay, thanks. I spoke with my newspaper, with the web page, to tell them what is happening in detail. But for the moment, we don't have much information, and we're not sure how it's going to end.
The suicidal man is refusing to come down, but is making no demands. Just the misfortune of having been expelled by the United States. Negotiating with him is not easy. They have to find a way to negotiate with him first, because it's just as dangerous for him as it is for the person going up to get him. Because it can move, they can fall. It's nearly midday. The man has been standing on the edge of the platform for almost six hours. When suddenly... The rescuers pounce, but he fell 15 meters. Please stand back, come on, move along please gentlemen. It's very sad. It's sad to see this. Here, in front of so many people. Plus, on the day of love, friendship, it's Valentine's Day. I thought it might have ended differently. But he really decided to get it over with. Evening report on the El Frontera newspaper website. The young man who jumped from the top of an electrical installation this morning was immediately attended to by emergency services and taken to hospital, where he was pronounced dead. The fire chief declared that the man was mentally fit. He was a hot dog vendor in the USA before being deported and had no family in Tijuana. Tijuana. 1,600,000 inhabitants, and as many destinies, all of which lead back to the border. I want to see this border, which has just caused a man's death before my eyes. With a French passport, I am a legal migrant, on the way to San Isidro, the world's largest border crossing. Seen from the sky, a huge funnel. And it never stops, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. It's 10 a.m. on Sunday and the traffic is already jammed. Around the cars, hundreds of street vendors. You find everything, sandwiches, drinks, newspapers, clothes and even toys for the kids. There are 15 lanes to cross, but that's not enough. So people also cross on foot, to go to work, visit a relative or go shopping. Half a million cross-border commuters pass through here every day. On the Mexican side, nobody. But on the American side, cameras, sensors and vigilant customs officers. They have dogs trained to smell cocaine, or human flesh. Filming is forbidden, so we film these few images with a phone. Here we go, we are in the United States. A little over three hours to get through a border crossing, it's quite surreal. You have to live it because you put yourself in the shoes of the migrant, and having lived it myself in other countries, having been a migrant in other countries, it does something. San Isidro is for those with papers. To dissuade others, there's this, a wall. 1,200 kilometers of wall, set at strategic points along this immense 3,200 kilometer border, between the Atlantic and the Pacific. In Tijuana, the wall even plunges into the ocean. At five meters high, it is almost impassable. That's the old wall. The wall of Operation Gatekeeper. Enrique was born on the right side of the wall. For 20 years, 
he has been fighting against the immigration policy of his country, the United States. The new wall, which was President Bush, was this wall. This is the new wall. This is much higher. It takes longer to, to, to jump, you know, to cross over, to jump over. See, now your arm's in Mexico, so this is Mexico right here. Mm -hmm. This is Mexico. This is the U.S. They have started their journey in Mexico or Central America. And they're working their way up and then they'll hide. And then they'll wait till the agent is busy. That's when they'll try to cross over. Every day, a wave of people crashes against the border. Last night, a man died. He had just crossed the wall. Surprised by border guards, he threw a stone. The guard shot him. What happened yesterday was very sad. A young man was killed simply because he was hungry. And he had no way to come in through the front door, so he risks his life. And, and he panicked, and he threw a rock, and he got killed. But there's even more effective than the wall, the desert. Ice cold at night, scorching hot during the day. Many migrants die of cold or thirst. For them, Enrique drops off bottles of water at random. Yes, a honeymoon, it's no trace. Yes, yeah, the animals and jumps over the wall. And then they hide here, they'll hide. It gets really hot, so they grab the water and keep on running. So we leave this water in strategic locations. You, you pass uh, every day, every right? Every week? Every week. Every, every week. week, yeah. yeah. Here's one of our bottles right over here. This one's still here. This yeah, so here. Not yours, yeah? It will be lukewarm, it will have a taste of plastic. But for those who are thirsty, it will be a small miracle, a helping hand on the road. Back to the Mexican side. At the border crossing, it's 10 p.m., but there's always traffic. A small ceremony is being held in memory of the migrant shot dead yesterday. I'm angry. I'm angry because they killed another Mexican. It could have been me, it could have been my cousin, my friend, it could have been anyone. Hey guys, we're bringing the candles now. This is something unacceptable, you understand. It really hurts us. It's going to be a long night. I'm going with the police on patrol. Night shift begins. Attention. At ease. Robocop gear, assault rifle, bulletproof vest, and heavy helmet. We will now begin our patrol. In formation? Go! This is the unit's boss, Commander Lara. This is a wall of honor of men who died doing their duty. It's only for the city of Tijuana. I knew all these men personally. I worked with them. 14 dead in 12 years. Even for overarmed police officers, the streets of Tijuana are not safe. Go ahead, go. 8.30 p.m., the patrol begins.
a convoy of three cars to limit the risks, and to show its strength. ¿Qué le pasaron al central que están 18 a Castro? To Central, we're chasing a black Mustang. Street number eight. Black Mustang, license plate GTB 5778. First intervention after 20 minutes on duty. One of the missions of the state police is prevention. How do we do prevention? Well, for example, by stopping suspicious vehicles. And how do you recognize a suspicious vehicle? It's simple. It's a sports car with tinted windows. Drug traffickers have always had a taste for bling. This time, everything's in order. The patrol carries on. Midnight, emergency call. They've reported a kidnapping. Sirens blaring and 160 kilometers per hour. We're heading for the scene of the events at the Rosarito. The kidnapping took place in a hostess bar. We'll park here. Hey, is that a shell? Did they shoot? Yes, they arrived by car this way. What caliber is it? Size 40 or 45? Uh -huh. Has the car been identified? Uh huh. It's a big SUV, so they went that way, and then they went straight in. You see, they fired from that spot. Uh -huh. Are there cameras? Is this a 45? No, there are no cameras. Are you the manager? No, he's the one who was kidnapped. I'm just a friend. Ah, it's the manager they took away. What's his name? Antonio Garcia, and they took a waiter too. The kidnappers took all the risks, the place was packed. They fired into the crowd, it's a miracle there were no casualties. The customers and the girls flew away like sparrows. Only this waiter remains, shocked. We were there and they came in that way and started fighting. Some people got up and others came in from behind too. They wanted to rob us all. They threatened us with long guns. Not a minute to lose, the kidnappers didn't have time to go far. I'm setting up a roadblock on the main road through Rosarito, Tijuana. No one will be able to leave that way. Surrounding the commander, men from the anti-gang unit, come as reinforcements. The hunt is on. The kidnappers have a large dark SUV. Just like this one. They're trying to escape. Your papers, please. I live here. Yeah. 10-4. Okay, take your card back. Wrong person. These young people from good families don't fit the profile. The search will last all night, without success. Press conference the next morning at police headquarters. I see Luis again, the journalist from El Frontera. I had met him the day of that spectacular suicide. We are in contact with the victim's family. 
Any information on the person kidnapped yesterday in Rosarito? No, anyway, this case doesn't fall under our jurisdiction. You'll have to check with the Rosarito prosecutor. But according to the information we got from the anti-kidnapping group, it's an attempt at deprivation of liberty. We went there to check it out, but no, it's not a kidnapping. Beware of legal subtleties. To make it officially kidnapping, it requires a ransom demand. Otherwise, it's a simple deprivation of liberty. And it looks better in police statistics. PR is important. By the way, the inspector has a little surprise for the media. A kidnapper, in the flesh, arrested in another case. Here he is, answering reporters' questions. Unthinkable in France. How many kidnappings did you take part in? Just one. The young man in Sinaloa? Who's your boss? I don't know, I was just phoned. Where did you take him? On a road. Where? In the state of Nayarit. For how long? Four years. How much did they pay you? 20,000 pesos. Why did you do it? To work. A small fish, not yet judged, but one that will be on TV screens everywhere in a few minutes. Face not blurred. It doesn't shock Luis. We have the right to ask questions. After that, it's up to the suspect. If he agrees, he can answer. We're allowed one or two questions. The kidnapper is remanded in custody. What are Tijuana's prisons like? I take the road east, towards El Hongo, an ultra-modern prison built in the middle of the desert. Mineral landscape. Here, runaways could be spotted from afar. Behind the walls, almost a thousand inmates, the largest prison in the region. But above all, it's a model prison, inaugurated only five years ago. The director himself gives me a tour. Only one rule, no talking to the prisoners. In this penitentiary complex, we have the least dangerous inmates on one side, and all those who represent a higher risk on the other. And then there are the living modules with the school and canteen. In France, I give cooking classes in prison. I'll be able to compare the two prison worlds. Next stop, the security control room. Ultramodern as well. Nothing escapes the eye of the prison's 170 cameras. I select the camera, and with this simple joystick, I direct it where I want and can even zoom in. Here, for example, I can see the whole sports field and zoom in like this. Have there ever been any escape attempts? Until today, no. Because we strictly respect all procedures every day, 24 hours a day, Saturday and Sunday. The cameras keep rolling around the clock, 
even in the cells. Privacy, nil. The cells are the next part of the visit. Everybody to the back. Hands behind your back. Line up. Let's go. To the back. To the back. Line up the prisoners, that's the procedure. A little sign from the guard, good to go. Most of these prisoners are here for theft. They are not very dangerous, and this is their bed. Each has his own space and number. They have a database in our IT department with all their files. As you can see, each inmate has a card with an identification barcode. Simply scan the barcode and the inmate's entire history is displayed. But what happens if the technology ever gets into the wrong hands? We're now approaching a sensitive area. A strong room, the prison armory. Beretta. Red gun. That's the HK-762, a hard-hitting weapon. <coughs> with dual supply. So here we're dealing with gear. Which is heavy. In terms of intervention. I'm a former paratrooper, and I've retained a respect for weapons. As always, all depends on the men handling them. There are a thousand men in this penitentiary, it can quickly turn into rather intense conflict zones. So we have to protect our staff, and society too. A few armored doors further, I enter another kind of armory, that of the inmates. Everything here can be used as a weapon. All tools, such as hammers, are stored here. For each tool, we put the name that corresponds to the photo. It's really well done. There is immediate control. Simple and effective. Hyperprudence to avoid hyperviolence. There's an atmosphere in detention that's palpable, but inexplicable. Those who have never experienced the world of detention, and all the better for it. Even for a visitor like me, whether in France or anywhere else in the world, there's always a very particular atmosphere of people being locked up. And then we can talk about it. Everything that needs to be done in these detention centers to improve things and above all to create a project after prison, that's what's going to be important. But the atmosphere in a detention center is heavy. To relax and think about their release, there's the workshop. In this model prison, luxury mattresses are manufactured for export. Is there a salary for inmates? 
Yes, they get paid. It's a legal obligation. The salary is in three-thirds. One-third to compensate victims, one-third for their families, one-third for themselves. Each inmate receives five euros for eight hours work a day. That's a third of the minimum wage in Mexico. But beware of optical illusions. Daily life in Mexican prisons is more like that. These images were shot in Tijuana's other, much older and more violent prison, rape, racketeering, trafficking, and overcrowding that raises the temperature. In 2008, a riot left 19 people dead. My visit to El Hongo is coming to an end, but the director has prepared a surprise for me. You're sure, even me, for my hair. No exceptions. Mandatory hairnet, I'm beginning to suspect something. A gift, a kitchen apron for you. I'm very touched, I'm going to take it home as an important souvenir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. A tour of their model kitchen. This is chicken and cream sauce, today's menu for inmates. Chicken finished in a tortilla, the other Mexican classic after tacos. They all have the gestures of cooks and do things with application. We detail each recipe to teach them the basics, how to cut the vegetables, how to cook, and at what temperature. The idea is to pass on know-how. Before me, the chef launches into a small creation. Mushrooms, soya, bacon, onions, we're leaving Mexican standards. He's giving it a little Asian twist, I think to welcome me, because he knows I like Japanese food. A few drops of soy cream, as a thickener. Cooking also makes you travel, and that's important in detention, so he's found a way to make us travel. Even though we're practically in the middle of the desert. How do you like it? It's good. Time to get back to town. In Tijuana, my surprises are far from over. I'll meet the ghosts of the American dream. Those who used to live in the United States before being expelled, and who have been hanging around in wastelands ever since. I'll follow a news photographer on his crazy day, going from one crime scene to another. I'll take a hidden camera into giant brothels, open 24 hours a day. And I'll experience firsthand the arrest of a drug baron and the seizure of his arsenal. When night falls on Tijuana, it's all you see. Lit up like a soccer stadium. Long as a wound. It cuts the landscape in two, the border. Even at night, people return to it. And the police are never far away. Routine patrol. Isn't that a car back there? A silhouette, as if this no man's land were inhabited. There are people here, migrants deported by the United States. Lots of drug addicts. To survive, they work in town. Chief Sergeant Hector. He and his colleagues from the municipal police will be blurred. To earn a few pennies, they panhandle. They wash cars. But many of them steal. It's a real problem. There are around 3,000 people living here. 
They've built shelters for themselves, even underground, which is a big problem for us. 3,000 people, a small town. It's hard to believe. There's someone over there. There are humans living here. Not a house, not even a shelter. More like a burrow, with a few personal items salvaged from the wreck. That's the reality for these people. Look, there's another entrance, it's a cave. There's nobody. Did you check it yet? No. All this is housing. Here, look, everything's connected. We'll see if there's anything illicit. Maybe drugs. I'll get you a stick. What's this? Wait, it's sharp. Ah, it's a knife. It's a weapon. Some sort of homemade spear, perhaps to protect against aggression. Hector's colleague has found something else. It's not coming from here, that's for sure. It's probably from a robbery. It's a telescope. Yeah, they use it to see us coming. So this is the bandit's cult, Saint Death. All the homeless have adopted her for themselves, but she's normally the patron saint of drug traffickers. She can even be found in the homes of drug lords. They invoke her for good luck to ensure that nothing ever happens to their business or their drug shipment. At least drug traffickers have a roof over their heads, a family, plans. These invisibles have nothing, they're the borough people. I'll be back to meet them in daylight. We're off to the city center, it's Saturday evening. The police have just received a call. 10-4, Okay, here we go. The owner of an internet cafe complained. Right or left? No, no, go further, there's too much traffic. Some youngsters were smoking pot in front of the computers. Come on, kids, up against the wall. You too, son. Come on, everybody over there. A quick look inside, there's a smell of pot, but apparently no smokers. Hey there. You go with the others too. Go ahead and empty your pockets, everything you've got. That too? Yes, all of it. We need to check that they're not already wanted. Apparently they have drugs on us. Boys over here, we're going to do a search over here. You stand against the vehicle. What are you doing here tonight? Me? Nothing. I was just going out with my girlfriend. Yes, that's right. You're all supposedly going out with your girlfriend, and the girlfriends in question never show up, right? Nothing suspicious. You shouldn't smoke. You there, take off your hat. Okay, we're letting you go home. This time, we're not taking you to the municipal prison or the juvenile detention center. You can't smoke here, you know that. It's no secret. Even if Tijuana is one of the cocaine capitals of the world, the cops don't give up for a single joint. The patrol carries on. Uh, 
Look, I'm gonna check out this guy. Hey son, what are you doing? No, I'm just hanging out, drinking water. Come on, turn around. Put your hands on the fence. Okay. Don't move. Yeah. Are you drinking? No, 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 it just sat there. And what's this? It's crystal, isn't it? Crystal, a synthetic drug. One of the cheapest, one of the strongest. Is this one? I have to check his pockets. And what's all this? Chewing gum. Yeah, or drugs. <laughs> How long have you been taking crystal? About four months. Come on, let's take him in. Come on, buddy, lay off the drugs. They're no good for you, they'll only get you into trouble, and it's obvious you haven't been taking them for long. Those who have been taking drugs for a long time are thin. Ah, and now you're showing your ass. Crystal is a really addictive drug. You lose your appetite, your sleep, you have energy for two or three days in a row. It's really powerful. Are we going to the station? Yes. The man is led to his cell, he will be heard by the judge later. Many are already waiting behind these bars. Here they are, the ghosts of the border, those who survive in burrows. In town, they wash cars or sell clothes on the sly. These were picked up by the patrol. They are presented to the judge in the gray suit. Five minutes per case, resulting in short prison sentences, between 3 and 36 hours. Jesus, Jesus Alberto Perez. Good evening. Good evening. The officer arrested you for taking part in a gathering in a public place. This is not authorized. Why? Because you were demonstrating in a public place. You've got papers? You're entitled to a phone call. The thing is, I don't have any papers at the moment. Because I've been deported from the U.S. I've had all my stuff stolen. Are you working right now? Yes, but I was deported. Being deported is not an activity. Yes, all right. It's an antecedent to your legal situation in Mexico. I work in maintenance. I do painting and things like that to survive. Do you have ID or not? No, as I said, I don't have any. Do you have proof of address or of your activities in Mexico? No, really, I can't show you anything. No, you don't have anything? Now I'm only going to sentence you for gathering in a public place because it contributes to insecurity. Jose Ramon Ramirez Paz. Jose Ramon Ramirez Paz. Putting misery in prison, in Tijuana as in Paris, is not a solution. We're going to fill in the report now. It'll just take two minutes. We have a very wide range of operations, from lost children to snatch theft to armed robbery. There are other police services that help us, but at the municipal police, we're always the first on the scene. In the end, this forces these men to analyze very quickly, to be both very versatile and very discerning in their actions. Yes, we always try to have a talk with people before taking them to the station. Each time, we try to identify those who really deserve 
deserve to be arrested. In the past, people found it hard to trust us. There was a lot of corruption, it has to be said, and even certain officers involved in drug trafficking. And then there was a great purge in the last years, and many dirty cops were disbarred and thrown out of the force. And that's why people are now very positive about us. Okay, shall we carry on? You have the record? Uh, yeah. Si. It's 10 p.m., Saturday Night Fever. We enter the red light district. Prostitution is an illegal activity. But well, we tolerate it. How many are there in these streets? Maybe two, three thousand. Many of them wanted to cross the border into the U.S., but they couldn't. And they got stuck here in Tijuana. Then there's a crime called white slavery, where people kidnap girls in other Mexican states and force them to work here. Sometimes we receive denunciations or alerts, and we can intervene and rescue them. Who are these women? How do they survive in this violent masculine world? One of the policemen agrees to accompany me after the patrol. Here he is. He's in plain clothes. We're doing a hidden camera shoot. We'll pretend to be ordinary customers. The girls are being watched. Fifteen euros for a trick and five for the room. That's twenty in all. And for any position you want. No, no, this street is the cheapest. This is really low-end prostitution. Less money and more risk. Street girls are at the bottom of the ladder. euros for 20 to 25 minutes. 20 to 25 minutes? And two positions. <laughs> <laughs> what does it include? For 20 minutes, it's 15 euros. And if you want nude, it's 15 euros more. If I want what? The girl naked, completely naked. It's 15 euros more. These girls take on up to 30 customers a night. It's slaughter. And then there are the hostess bars, a specialty in Tijuana. At the entrance, compulsory search, a wise precaution given the number of weapons in circulation. Inside, a saloon atmosphere, a hundred strippers, two floors, and a huge bar. Don't forget to order tequila shots 24-7. The DJ speaks English, but all the customers are Mexican. The Americans who used to come to Tijuana to debase themselves deserted long ago, too dangerous. There are girls on stage, and those in line, waiting for the customer. Discreet but very present security. Surprisingly, they don't accept pesos here, only dollars. I'll make you some change. How many dollars do you want? How much? 
50. The bartender gives me back $51 bills, and I quickly understand why. We take a table, the waiter brings us a girl, who obviously has no say in the matter, a second, and a third, blonde, on the left. As soon as they sit down, the server takes the order. And where are you from? I'm from Paris. A second waiter comes to check that we have indeed ordered. Then a third. Three beers, 20 bucks. A well-oiled system. The waiter on the left asks the girls for their number. Each one has to reach their quota and get people to drink around 30 beers a night. Shall we go to the hotel? How much? $80. And do you smoke? No, I don't smoke. Do you? Yes, I smoke. But marijuana. Marijuana. Want? She's got coke too. We can bring you some in the bedroom. In Tijuana, drugs are never far away. Distraction for the customers, and perhaps even escape for the prostitutes. Fortunately, there are some hopeful colors in this picture. This morning, I have an appointment at a secret location. Drug traffickers would pay dearly to know the address. There are prostitutes here who have escaped them and are slowly rebuilding themselves. Safe from reprisals. Most girl, like, girls who have not experienced trauma have no problem being touched. Be they, however, have suffered a great deal of violence. It's a way for them to learn healthy touch. This workshop is my way of gently getting in touch with them. a lot of violent touch. All are minors, except Karen. Today, she dares to testify openly, and her story is unbearable. Dentro de los cuartos. Inside the rooms, there were cameras. The first evening, I started at night, from 10 p.m. until 5 a.m. And I started again right away at 8 a.m. until 2 a.m. I was forced to have sex with 25 to 30 men a day. I had to bring in 1,700 euros every day. When I didn't reach the amount, he'd come and hit me. He threatened me with reprisals against my family and told me that the day I ran away, he'd go straight to them. He said he was going to do the same thing to my sister and even kill her. As well as being raped by other men, he used to rape me too. He forced me to have sex with him and also anal sex. And all the while, he was hitting me and telling me I was a bastard and a cheap slut. Karen has been here for two years and will leave when she's ready. 
For these girls, broken by life, any male presence can feel like a threat. But there is the kitchen. Just beat the eggs. A vegetable peeler that peels backwards, so it's not very funny. What's your name? Thierry. Oh. Two hand. Both hands. <laughs> Just like that, easy. It's funny because everyone got down to work pretty quickly. The magic of cooking is to create this bond every time, no matter what universe you're in. Hello, how are you? Sir, how are you? Okay. Answer. Yes, I'm well. And you? How are you? I'm well. I am well. <laughs> this French is really simple. Chef? Yeah? I'm hungry. Tu as faim, ok, on est. Je suis prêt, je suis prêt. Je suis prêt, chef. I'm very hungry. Ah, hungry. I'm ready for the, for the heat, snow. Fried tomatoes, peppers and candied potatoes, these were my recipes, and I learned the most today. There are only two centers like this in Mexico, it would be a good investment to open more. I'm back at the border, where I was yesterday with the patrol, and here they are, the little borough people. Out in the open, crushed by light and heat. How is life organized on this small piece of land? Is it rather peaceful, or are there tensions at times? Sometimes it's difficult with the police. We have problems with them. They don't want us here, so it's not easy. Excuse me, everything's a mess. We're tidying up. The politeness of despair. Behind him, his wife is pretending to tidy things up. We live from day to day, trying to find what we can to survive, that's all. That's the way it is. We are here trying to turn back the clock, to go back to the United States. What helps us sometimes is the fog. When the fog comes, it's easier to sneak in. We can't be seen. Sometimes it's there, but not right now. And this helps to get through to the other side. It's like when it rains, you know? And if not, we'll try to find a way to get out of here. Because it sucks here. You could spend your life here. I don't know. It's as if the border were a magnet. A magnet. There's something fatal about it, but it's possible to sink even lower. On the other side of the canal, a few meters from here, dignity is a memory.
This is junky territory. Their only link with the rest of the world, this NGO, which gives out water and needles. How are things with the police? Oh, not well. What have they done? Uh, they stole from me. Wait, did you take your needles? got my things. This is my bed and this is where I sleep. No, I'm alive and dead at the same time. That's what I say. I'm a dead person who goes on living. It's like that when you take drugs. It's like that when you take heroin. How many will make it out of here? How many will stay? This border drives humans mad, drug traffickers, for example, are spending fortunes building tunnels. They buy houses, the ones closest to the border, and dig. These have been walled off, because their tunnels have been discovered. The tunnels plunge deep. There's electricity, ventilation, and sometimes even rails and wagons. Drug traffickers smuggle cocaine and men. Drugs and migration. The two bloody businesses of Tijuana. On street number four in Morello Street, there's a casualty. Margarito spends his life tuned into police broadcasts. He's an old news fox. Copy that. Is he shot? I'm spending the day with him. Yes, one shot. He was also hit by a car. They just said the guy was shot in the shoulder. In the shoulder. He was also hit by a car. This is the municipal police radio. And it's not encrypted. Anti-drugs or anti-crime units, on the other hand, are impossible to scan. We arrive on the scene. They've secured the perimeter. Margarito got beaten by a TV crew. The injured man has just died. The body's been covered. Next to it, his bike, bended by the accident. Margarito learns that the assassin's vehicle has been found a few streets away. Margarito, I told them to let you through. 
Qué bueno. That's good. Este, qué onda. So, did you catch him? El bar. Guy? No, no. No, no. Just his car. Llegó y hizo su Came, made him say his last prayer, beat him up and left. Le, le echó la, la, he wrecked him with his SUV, la, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And that's when he shot him? What did he use? A nine millimeter? No, we don't know about the gun. Apparently they were arguing, but we don't know why. Yeah, that kind of thing happens a lot. Whoever knows where you are finds you, and that's that. Well then, gentlemen, I'll take my leave. See you soon. Goodbye, gentlemen. Have you seen how the police treat me? When you manage to interact with them, everything happens differently. It makes your work a lot easier. They know you, they know who you are, and they know how you work, and that's cool. I love my work. It's really different from the normal jobs I know, like mechanic, electrician, lawyer, or working in an office. My work is very different. I see the reality of things, everything that's good and bad in this society. Bad luck for Margarito. Today's program is all about the bad. Another murder has just been reported in a supermarket parking lot. This time, Margarito arrives first. And why hasn't the forensic team arrived yet? They've got loads of work. Already four guys executed today. They're busy elsewhere. They're on their way. Is there only one team in all of Tijuana? In all of Tijuana? Yes, it's the weekend. There's only one team on the periphery, but this is not possible. There are kids seeing this. People just shouldn't look. No, the government has to do its job. The victim was returning to his car with his groceries, the eggs fell out of the bag. Several casings are on the ground right next to the body, point-blank shots. For me, as a reporter, all you're seeing now are not confrontations like they used to be. These people, they kill you for money. Because you owe them $150, they kill for a yes or a no. Anyone has a gun here. Not everything is linked to organized crime. Margarito's day ends on the heights of Tijuana. It's a poor suburb. And the powder has spoken again. Three dead, three men from the same family. The crime scene will remain inaccessible. The police stretched blankets out to the funeral truck. Still, it seems a little less intense than it was in 2010-2011. That's when the most executions took place, due to drug trafficking. However, this week, 
We're at six, no, nine. Nine homicides in one week. It looks like the executions are back on. I hadn't realized they'd slowed down since I arrived. And yet, the worst may be behind Tijuana. When drug cartels went to war. An absolute nightmare took place in 2009. The police discover human remains in acid tanks. It was this man, Santiago Mela Lopez, who made the bodies disappear. How many bodies? Roughly 300. What did you do with them? I put them in a tank with acid and they'd go like that. Where did you buy the acid? I used to buy it just about anywhere. Where did you buy it? Just about anywhere. How long does it take to dissolve a body? 24 hours. The country is in shock. The press finds Lopez a nickname, El Pasolero, the stirrer. This morning, I have an appointment in front of the House of Horror. I'm meeting a victim's father there. Fernando's son was 23. He saw him leave the house one evening in 2007 with some friends. Since then, mourning has been impossible. This is the kitchen. Here, there was a tank. And here, another tank. You would put the bodies in. Underneath, there was a fire fueled by a gas bottle. Right there. He'd heat it up for 24 hours, then come back, open the valve and it'd all go down. And so it went on, with more and more bodies. Here, there was a pipe connected to the tank. And then another pipe here, to a second tank. It went down with the slope. A lot of bodies have gone, just like that. Today, the families have taken over the site and turned it into a memorial. The question is, what happened here? But what really happened here? That's the question. Where are they and what happened? These unanswered questions have tortured hundreds of families. For example, some parents have hanged themselves. Some parents have taken medication to help them fall asleep. And some have slit their wrists. Some died, others didn't. Each parent's experience of the tragedy was different. In my case, I feel a certain peace. Because I've accepted that I would never see my son alive again. And that he is dead today. But still, it's not easy to explain what I'm going through. Did you feel supported by the authorities or are you going through this alone? I feel alone. The only people who have really helped me are the victims' dads, their families. Because if you go to the government, they tell you they'll help you. But as soon as you leave the office, you don't hear from them. They say, we'll help you. But it's all lies. But the state is incapable of providing the one thing that could really appease Fernando. This is what I'd like. 
It's to finally see DNA evidence that would say my son has been found. Eventually, to finally be able to say to his mother, look, this is all I have of your son. So that my wife and I have a place to mourn him. Together. It's a lot of emotion. Good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Where do the dead souls of Tijuana go? God, if he exists, hasn't been paying much attention to the city lately. In just a few days, I was shaken by what I saw. By the power of human tragedy. My stay is coming to an end. Last evening, last police patrol. It's off to a flying start. Hello, dispatch. Hit and run with shots fired. It's a gray SUV. Okay. Where? Where's the chase? Tell me. There, there. Turn here. Where's the SUV? What level? We're on our way over the bridge to Independence Square. We're on our way to Independence 2. I've just seen them go by. They're arriving via San Cristobal. Watch out, they're armed. The fugitives are trapped. The man in the cap remains very calm. He was the one driving. From the outside, I can just see a casing. We'll continue searching the vehicle. Over. Apparently no weapons, but a shell casing. A large caliber. Are you the owner? Yes, it's me. Hey, watch him. Put him up against the car. Okay. Do you have your ID card? Yes. In your wallet? What do you do? Construction. Where's the gun? What gun? The gun used to fire the shell on the seat. No, I didn't see any guns. I don't know anything about that. Arrived on its own. How did the bullet get there? Park the car here. Hello Central, so his identity. Rafael Mendez Peña. Keep a close eye on this one. Found anything? We are. This casing found on the front seat was not there by chance. It's a 1050 or 1051. There are two of them. Police codes, 1050, short gun, 1051, long gun. Ten fifty. This is the second one. The third. And a second weapon. Two short weapons. Look closely, the first gun is made of gold. The man in the cap is someone important.
and there's more to come. Hey, get out of there. There's a long gun. It could go off at any second. Another gun. Careful. No one in front. I'm taking it out. Chief, please step aside. Step aside. It could go off. Yes, don't go that way. He said it could go off. It's starting to be a lot. More? Yes, there are more. And a charger. There's more. People should really not be in front. Three assault rifles, three handguns, and magazines. There was an arsenal behind the dashboard. The man in the cap is probably a drug lord. The police are getting scared. This guy's not anybody. We're going to need backup here. They need to come. Hello, dispatch. We need backup. If news of the arrest spreads, the clan of the man in the cap may do everything in their power to free him. We have to put one car here and another there. Emergency departure for the central police station. Okay, let's go. All teams, we're going by the boulevard. Go on, get going, we'll follow him. These will be my last images of Tijuana, a beautiful symbol. Of course, the war against drug traffickers is not about to end. But tonight, the police won a battle. In Tijuana, crime has failed to kill hope.